Hello, everyone. Welcome to another DCAL webinar. I'm Ben, of course, your faithful host. We are going to let folks stream in here. We are very, very excited that you're joining us. Welcome to Bad Form. We are very excited to reveal some research that we did here and some principles that came from that research. Thanks, Ben. Um, what an intro. <laughs> we are very, very excited um, to share some of the details of this gender identity project that we have been in the weeds in for the past uh, month or so, or the past couple months. But before we jump into the details, um, I wanted to just take a moment and introduce ourselves and um, talk a little bit about why we are the ones presenting this content today. Um, so with that, I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Jess and I've worked at DScout for the past four years. Uh, three of those years, I was part of the customer success team um, as a lead research advisor. That basically just meant that I helped clients design and execute their research using the DScout platform. The last year I've moved into more of a data focused role. So I'm currently the director of business intelligence and just a general data nerd. <clears throat> um, additionally, being trans and non-binary is a huge part of, the, of my identity and the way that I move through the world. Um, and so this was a very personal project to me and also just very, very special to me. And I'm Lindsay. Um, I've been a research analyst on the studio team for over three years. Um, and on the studio, we use our DScout platform all the time to execute large research projects with a variety of clients. And we kind of consider ourselves to be the DScout experts. Uh, we do a lot of straightforward projects like developing insights and opportunity spaces in tech, but we also work on abstract, hairy, and complicated projects uh, related to relationships and understanding the nuances of human behavior. Um, so I'm definitely a people nerd. Um, being on the studio is like being able to peer into people's lives directly through their phones, which is creepy and amazing. Um, and I'm part of this project because I started learning about how to be an ally in my workplace after attending a panel about queer representation in tech. Um, and so an ally is someone who's not a part of an underrepresented group, but takes action to support that group. So I decided I wanted to push hard to make changes happen in our company and on our app to make our space more inclusive for employees and scouts. Um, we want to give a shout out to everyone who's on this page for the amazing work that they did to bring this deck together and help contribute to the research analysis process, um, as well as the product design. Um, and we also want to give a call out to the teams that aren't mentioned on this page, the entire product team, the engineering team, the customer success team, and the studio. All of those teams came together to chip in their time and energy to make this project happen. So thank you, everyone. Um, and we also really want to call out DScout itself, because as a company and a culture, DScout gave us the space and the time to make this work happen. And leadership facilitated this and really embraced it and let us dive in and give this topic the time it needed in order to do it right. Um, they saw our passion for inclusivity and let us take this on and we're really grateful because being able to work at a company that cares enough about its employees to give them power and space to take ownership is really special. All right. So let's get started. Um, why is this important to DScout? Um, at DScout, we work very closely with our participants who we call scouts. Uh, to see the experiences that matter most to them in the context of their real lives. And we're often asking scouts to share moments of their lives as they happen, and it's critical that we gather the context of those moments accurately. So what do we do when we realize that that context might not be accurate? It's kind of the place where this project started. So before we get too far into the weeds of the actual research design and project, I'd like to pause and take a moment to define a few key terms that we'll refer to throughout this entire talk, just to make sure we're all speaking from the same page. <clears throat> so first up, let's talk about gender identity. You can think of this as your concept of your own gender or the way you express yourself and move through the world. This may or may not correlate with the sex you were assigned at birth. Cisgender is an example of this. If someone's sex assigned at birth matches their gender identity, that's what we refer to as a cisgendered person. For a lot of the population, this is the case, and it isn't really something that comes up for most people because the world we live in embraces the idea of a gender binary. That brings us to gender binary. <clears throat> Here we're referring to the general assumption that there are only two genders and that they are opposing forms of masculine and feminine. Um, these forms are also reinforced by structures of our society and culture. 
So non-binary is basically the opposite of that. In general, it's not the classification of gender into two distinct and opposing forms. But usually when someone says non-binary and kind of the way that we'll use it throughout this um, presentation is to refer to a specific person and someone who identifies outside of the gender binary. So that means that their gender doesn't fall into these two categories, but instead might be along a spectrum between them or undefinable at all. So now that we kind of have some terms um, defined together, let's jump back into the actual project. Awesome. Thanks, Jess. Um, so the society we live in, like Jess mentioned, largely operates in a way that reinforces the gender binary. And this is something you can observe around you in the way that most public restrooms are segregated into male and female. The way clothing stores often will specify men's and women's clothing sections. And the way we often use language like man or woman, Mr. or Mrs. Language that implies that there are only two genders and you can only be one of them. And for a long time, the D-Scout platform was no different. But the world's changing and our understanding of gender is evolving and our platform wasn't really keeping up. Um, and in fact, we were excluding potential scouts who wanted to be a part of our platform, but because they weren't part of the gender binary, they were essentially being turned away at the door when they were met with our restrictive language. So we realized we had a problem. The D-Scout app requires scouts to fill out a profile and to specify their gender in order to fill out applications for our studies. But for a long time, the only options we had were male and female. So anyone who wanted to participate in our studies but didn't identify as a man or a woman had to essentially erase their identity and choose an incorrect gender option in order to proceed. Uh, so if our mission at D-Scout is to capture context accurately, then any data we got from those folks had been incorrectly coded as male or female, which not only isn't accurate, it doesn't reflect Scout's true identities, which, as the Scout on this page noted, isn't great research. Um, as a side note, uh, throughout this presentation, you'll see quotes from the Scouts we talked to. Some gave full permission for us to use their name and face alongside those quotes, and others asked to remain anonymous. And so we're honoring that by showing a graphic instead of a profile picture and by not including their name or identifying information. All right, so who did we talk to in this project? We knew we needed to talk specifically to the people this impacted, i.e. people who aren't able to accurately express their identities using male or female options. So in order to find those participants, we had to get kind of creative uh, because we wanted to talk to folks outside the binary, but our platform only, you know, it currently forces you to choose between binary options. So we kind of had to recruit scouts using social media, using this screenshot you see here, and get them into our platform by kind of skirting them around that profile step uh, so that they wouldn't be forced to you know, misidentify themselves. And while many were brought in from outside the platform, we were able to find actually a surprising number of scouts within our scout pool whose identities were actually being hidden or erased by our gender options. And so when we sent out the call for folks who felt that our language was limiting, we were able to find almost 70 people who identified in a variety of ways, as you can see here um, on this slide. And we talked to folks whose gender doesn't align with binary, whose gender isn't static, and those who don't even subscribe to the concept of gender at all. And a lot of the terms you see here aren't mutually exclusive. Some scouts may be a combination of these terms or may have identified a certain way previously and have since changed, or they could be in the process of figuring out how they identify now and they may need to change later. If you're curious about any of the language you see here throughout this presentation, um, please get in contact with us because we will include our emails and we'd love to have this discussion with you. There are a ton of resources out there um, to help people like me who were just starting to learn about these terms and topics. Um, and, you know, we can definitely share our knowledge with you and help you get up to speed. All right, so how do we design the research? How do we even approach this? Uh, we want to talk through the mission structure with you. So if you're not familiar with D-Scout lingo, a mission is a research project. And uh, parts within that mission are kind of discrete research tasks that focus on a specific topic. So we ran a D-Scout mission with four parts in it. And each part focused on a different experience or topic. Um, in order to get a better understanding of the problem we were solving, we first have to had to ask scouts to share everyday life experiences with us. Stories of when their gender was either seen and validated or silenced and misunderstood. 
And from there, we narrowed in on the digital experiences by asking them to share screenshots of both the best and the worst digital experiences that they've had. Um, and after that, we asked them to actually help us redesign our existing gender form using drawings and then talk us through those drawings. The cool thing about this mission structure is that after those first three parts and gathering the initial data, we took a week long break to analyze the stories, screenshots and drawings and then make a design of our own and present it back to the scouts. And so in the last part, scouts clicked through that prototype, talking us through their, talks, their thoughts and reactions as they went. And so we not only got a good look into their daily lives and historical experiences, but also a really robust usability and prototyping test. And we were able to do it all through DScout, which made our analysis process a lot easier. Um, all in all, this mission took about four weeks, and we were able to get some really solid footing to help us make these changes in our platform in a pretty short amount of time. So what kind of data did this give us? Um, we collected very personal selfie style video. Oh, sorry. We collected very personal selfie style videos where scouts shared some of their most vulnerable and challenging experiences with, with us firsthand. Um, hearing people share these experiences was really emotional and it helped all of us develop a strong sense of empathy with our scouts in order to walk in their shoes for a while and learn how they feel. Scouts also shared screenshots of digital experiences that stuck with them so we could see what they saw. We collected amazing drawings that the scouts made for us, showing us how they would redesign the section of our profile that asks for gender. And many people printed out our existing form in order to mark it up or submitted completely hand-drawn mock-ups of their own. And finally, we got a screen recording, as you can see here, um, where scouts were reacting to our prototype that we made in Envision. We were able to follow along with them as they clicked through the mock-up. And screen recording is a de-scout feature that allowed us to really understand their reactions in depth and hear their feedback in a more unfiltered way. Awesome, so now that we've talked about the research design, let's talk about what we learned. This first section is gonna be focused on the lived experience of our scouts. Um, we learned a lot about what it feels like to move through the world as someone who doesn't identify with the gender binary. And this was a really critical first step of redesigning our app. We couldn't do this work without knowing this. So, as someone who identifies as cisgender, the statement on this slide is true to my experience. I often take it for granted that the people around me will accept and understand my gender, and it's not something that I have to think about very often. I rarely, if ever, have an experience where my gender is questioned or where I'm given form options that don't fit, and I don't have to second guess or search to see myself in a form. My gender is there every time. Um, and I'd assume that for a lot of the people out there listening, this is probably not far from your experience as well. It can be really hard to understand what it's like because for someone like me, I don't have to know the feeling of being invalidated or silenced when it comes to my gender expression because our society has already made space for me. However, for most of our scouts, this is not often the case. Um, when we ask scouts to share invalidating moments and then tell us if those moments were typical or atypical, we learned that for a lot of them, having your gender identity invalidated or silenced is far more typical than having it validated or seen. So what does that look like? Um, on a day-to-day -day level, imagine if the people around you called you by the wrong name or referred to you using the wrong pronouns. Um, imagine if you needed to continually correct others or create space for your own gender. Imagine looking at movies or ads and not seeing anything that reflects your experience. We heard stories from scouts that ranged from mildly upsetting to traumatic and endangering. Some scouts got really emotional when they were talking on camera with us and sharing these stories. Um, we heard about scouts who were unable to get other people to call them by the right pronouns, even after taking the time to specify what they were. We heard scouts who feel excluded every time they, feel they sign up for a new service or app, every time they fill out a government form. Um, and even we, we heard from scouts who feel afraid to use public restrooms because their safety could be at risk. So we learned that most of the invalidating moments we collected actually happen in person, which is really uncomfortable if you think about it. I have never had someone question my gender in person. Um, so when we asked them to tell us how intense these emotions were that they felt in the moments, 99% of the moments were rated at over a five in intensity on a zero to 10 scale. 
and like 30% of them were at a full 10 out of 10 intensity. So scouts that were asked to share emotions they felt during these really intense in-person moments, you can see on the word cloud on the right what that looked like. Some of the words that came up the most frequently were invisible, frustrated, angry, embarrassed, uncomfortable, hurt, sad, not, not super positive. And when we asked scouts to share validating experiences, we saw that only 21% of those moments were classified as typical. The majority of them were out of the ordinary. And we heard that the bar is even super low for these moments. Something as simple as seeing a pronoun pin on someone's shirt or having someone ask you what your pronouns are, those things mean a lot when most of the world is ignoring or silencing you. And when we asked them to share digital experiences, it was clear it was no different. On apps and websites, these moments can be even more stark because in digital land, there's no chance to explain yourself or have a dialogue with a person. You can't educate or form. And so what you're seeing on this slide are actual screenshots that scouts submitted in our project. And one we want to call out in particular is this one on the bottom left um, saying with a pop-up, you can't change your gender, yo, with a sassy emoji, which our scouts felt was just kind of like a, a cruel mockery of their experience because the language was pretty disrespectful. And these stories echoed some of the themes we heard about in-person experiences. Moments that we heard about that happened on digital platforms were not only challenging because of the content of the interaction and the invalidation itself, but because of the rigid and inflexible barrier that digital moments create. So for example, for a scout whose gender expression has changed, challenging moments might come up when they're related to apps and services that require them to use their birth name, things like ride sharing services, things like payment apps, banking, you know, any type of medical or government form. And it can come up in unexpected, unexpected places, like a restaurant that calls out the name they grabbed from your credit card, which may be your birth name. The birth name isn't necessarily the proper name to be called by, and being referred to it can be a painful, shocking experience. Um, there are online interactions that don't protect non-binary individuals from discrimination or exclusion, both through omission and through outright hostility from other users. When we asked for the best digital experiences, although we've heard that the bar is already low for these, some scouts couldn't even think of a single positive experience in, this, in the digital world related to their gender identity. Many of the worst experiences were related to forms and profiles, about 60% of them. And these forms and profiles enforce the gender binary by only offering male and female as options. And oddly enough, some of the best experiences we heard were from the exact same app or company as the worst. For example, a dating app that offers an inclusive identity list up front, but then you know, when, you're, when it comes time to be shown, to have your profile shown to um, other people using the app, forces you to choose if you want it to be shown to men or women. Um, something like that feels like being tricked because having your gender validated up front, but then not having that follow through when it's later silenced can be actually worse than having no validation at all. And so, you know, we saw this in social media and dating platforms ride sharing, digital payment platforms, banking, medical and government forms, even things like retail personalization. Like if a, if a website asks you what your pronouns are up front, but then doesn't offer enough pronouns for you to actually be accommodated and then uses those pronouns throughout the entire app or website experience, that can be really frustrating. And we even heard online marketing surveys are a frequent culprit of this. And DScout was unfortunately no exception. We were mentioned multiple times among the worst digital experiences because of the restrictive gender language that you see in our profile. And this felt really misaligned with our core mission, to not meet people where they are and not allow them to express themselves properly and even force them to incorrectly identify themselves in order to participate felt totally wrong. Especially because as a company, we strive to be inclusive and take steps to accommodate and celebrate our non-binary employees. And so our outsides really need to match our insides. Great. So now that we've gone over the details of how we set up the research and how we collected the information, 
In part two, we're gonna walk you through what we did with that information. So how do we take this incredibly rich data, the stories, the designs, the drawings, the examples and feedback, and distill it into something we could actually take action on? Uh, what we came up with were some general design principles. So let's first talk about our approach to this analysis and how we use that to circle back and address the original problem that started all of this. So first, seeing DScout mentioned as an example of a negative experience really shined a light um, on the core goal of this project for us. We want DScout to be a positive experience for all of our users. So how can we do that? What steps could we take? that would shift this experience from the negative realm and push it more towards the positive. To put it simply, we asked our scouts directly. So within the mission itself, after they had completed the first two parts, telling us about their everyday lives and showing us examples of good and bad digital experiences, we prompted them to literally redesign the profile form in our app and also talk us through those changes and the reasoning why they made those. You can see from the few examples that we've thrown up on this slide that we received some incredible entries. We were really in awe and amazed at the amount of work that went into this part um, and the amount of detail that Scouts provided. Um, you could tell that it was something that they were really excited to communicate and really went above and beyond what we were asking. So how did we get from there to these design principles we've alluded to a few times now? Um, we're hoping that this chart helps summarize the flow of our process from those initial inputs, which is basically the mission data, uh, to our final output, which is a new redesigned experience. So first, let's talk about those initial inputs. We can think of those as the entries from that four-part mission. Um, one was the examples of the good and bad digital um, screenshots. Second were the first-hand everyday experiences in the form of those selfie videos. And third were the drawings and explanations of that redesigned DScout form. Um, so we dove into that information um, and looked at each and every one of them and then kind of backed up and looked at them in aggregation. Um, in this process, we were able to identify insights that summarized exactly what scouts were looking for and an ideal, looking for an ideal form experience to provide. As we started to group these different insights, they took the shape of four high-level design principles. We then use those principles to make specific changes um, to our existing experience. Uh, we listed out the changes, we specced them, we got the copy together, and then we handed it over to our product team. Thank you, product team. And they whipped out a prototype for us in Envision. Um, we then approached the scouts again. So we came back and said, hey, we heard you, we made some changes, how did we do? Um, so here is where Lindsay was showing how we were able to see the touches of the screen of how the scout interacted with our new prototype as they talked us through their initial reactions as their eyes were seeing it for the first time. So this was really rich and really exciting for us. Um, so the feedback from that part in the mission was again incorporated into our design and that's the design that we will be releasing to our app and platform in September. I do wanna mention that like in an ideal world, this blue and green little cycle really never ends, right? This isn't a static process and we wanna continually keep learning and improving our experience to keep up with changing word, the world and vocabulary. So what are these design principles that we base our changes around? Uh, the next few slides, we're gonna go into each one in detail. Um, so to give you a little preview of the structure, I'll, we'll talk about the principle. Um, I'll give you a, a few lines about what it means. We'll show some scout quotes that back up the way they talked about it. And then we'll also talk about the specific changes that we made to our product um, driven by that principle. Um, so at a very high level, they are first, question the question. Second, use language with care. Third, don't try to guess your user's identity, and fourth, follow through. So number one, question the question. Before we received any type of specific feedback on the actual design of the form or the wording of the options provided, many scouts asked us why we needed to collect this information at all. 
This challenged us to take a big step back and consider what we were asking and why. We realized that this is a pretty large ask, maybe a bigger ask than we've acknowledged in the past. This is information that in a lot of research, uh, especially you know, market and product, is included kind of just because, or historically it has been, instead of a specific reason or you know, an intentional um, collection. So this principle centers on the questions of, do you need it? Can you explain why you need it and what you'll do with it? If not, maybe you shouldn't be collecting it at all. So what actions did dscout take based around this principle? First, we created an opt-out option. Gender can be a very helpful way to slice data when you're researching products and services, but it's not required. And sometimes it's not even the best approach to get to the best insights. By creating an opt-out, we wanted our scouts to know that their comfort is more important than the data we are collecting about them. We also created a section explaining how the answers to this specific question will and won't be used. And we made it super transparent so it's directly under where we ask this question. By being this transparent about it and surfacing it on the same screen, uh, we're hoping that our scouts will feel more empowered to make the decision of whether they do or don't feel comfortable sharing this part of their identity with us. Great, so design principle number two. Use language with care. When talking about something as personal as the way someone identifies, the specific words and tone you use are hugely important. So how do you know the best way to talk about these things? What are the correct or right words to use? There's really no correct answer. You have to ask those that it impacts. In other words, you know, not to toot the D-scout horn or anything, but do your research. Get in contact with those that it impacts and talk to your users. This is the only way that you'll know that the changes you are making to the experience caters to them. We took three actions based on this use language with care design principle. First, we changed the prompt from select gender to which of the following best describes you. In this change, uh, we hope to communicate that we understand that our options listed aren't perfect or all encompassing. Second, we're going to change the options of female and male to woman and man. Um, a handful of our scouts pointed out that sex and gender are very different with different associated terms. And we were just using those incorrectly. We're actually mixing them up. Female and male refer to sex. For our purposes, we wanted to understand gender expression or gender, the way someone moves through the world, right? So not biological sex. We also labeled the write-in option prefer to self-identify. The standard language for write-in options in other part of our platform is other with parentheses tap to type. We heard from scouts that language like other or custom can feel like othering or outside of normal options. Whereas prefer to self-identify was seen as giving agency to the scout to really use their own words. All right, design principle number three. Don't try to guess your user's identity. We as humans are super complex and our identities are just as complex and constantly evolving. To assume that we can create an ex exhaustive list of the way folks identify is unrealistic. And it's also potentially overwhelming to our users. So just don't try to do that. We took two actions based on this design principle. First, we kept the option short, and second, we added that write-in option. This way, if the options presented on the screen didn't provide the scout um, with language they felt accurately represented them, they had the ability to use their own words. That way they could feel comfortable with it. I like this as well because I see this as also a built-in way of indirectly collecting feedback on the form itself as it's released. So let's say six months from now, um, we take a look at all the terms that were put in this write-in option, and we see that there are a few or maybe one that has a really high frequency um, of use. Maybe we should consider adding that to the standard options that are there. It's kind of keeping that feedback loop open in the green and blue cycle from the image we saw earlier. All right, that brings us to number four. Uh, design principle follow through. 
When we started this project, we knew the effort was going to be less about the specific form options um, and vocabulary and way more about the overall experience for our users. There's two main aspects of this principle to us. First, respecting the Scout's identity throughout the entire app experience, so not just when we're collecting the information. And second, taking steps to protect those Scouts from exclusion and discrimination based on the new way we were capturing and surfacing this information. Those changes are pretty big. They were very wide reaching in our products. Uh, they touched both our scout facing experience in the mobile app and our researcher facing experience in our web-based platform. We'll cover both changes, but let's first talk about the app, the scout facing changes. So for scouts, we added a brand new pronoun section to our profile. When we say pronouns, we're talking about the words used to describe someone instead of using their name. So you'll see here that we have three options, he, she, and they, and also the ability for scouts to add their own. When we asked scouts to redesign the gender section of our profile, many of those in designs included the addition of a pronoun section. We heard that they kind of go hand in hand. Um, you can't really fully, date, fully validate or respect someone's gender identity without also knowing and using their correct pronouns. So if we're gonna collect information related to gender, adding pronouns was a must. So how would these be used? Even in the use case where a scout isn't directly involved, we knew researchers would be discussing um, a scout and the entries that they provided to a project. So in order for them to refer to that scout respectfully and correctly, they needed to know their pronouns. So that's kind of a lot of words. Let's root this in an example, right? Okay, so my gender identity is non-binary and my pronouns are they, them. Let's assume that I'm a scout in a project um, and the researcher leading my project doesn't know my pronouns. There's no way for them to know it. Based on the information in my pronoun, in my profile, uh, my gender identity being non-binary and my profile photo, which shows that I present somewhat masculine, they might assume that I use he, him pronouns. And when referring to a point I've made in a project, would use those. So this would be incorrect, an example of not following through, right? So adding a direct line of communication to make pronouns accessible and transparent helps to correct this and also validate Scout's identity throughout the entire process. So how did this impact the researcher facing side of our product, the web-based platform? Like I mentioned before, we made pronouns front and center. We included them in all views where researchers interact with scouts or their submitted data. This means that a researcher looking at a scout profile, when they look at a scout profile or when they grab a quote from their entry, the, pro the pronouns are now included automatically. So now researchers will know how to talk about their scouts. For example, Jess's entries were amazing. Can you believe they had an experience on that app? I'm a very good participant. <laughs> we also changed some of the functionality on the researcher platform. Um, as a researcher on dscout, you can launch a screener, which is essentially um, an, a call for applications um, to our scout pool. So this invites scouts to apply for projects they are interested in. We used to allow researchers to pre-filter who sees these screeners based on their gender. This means that only scouts who had selected female in their dscout profile might see a project about makeup, whereas all the scouts who selected male wouldn't even have the chance to apply. We removed this pre-filter to encourage researchers to rely on behavioral data rather than gender to decide who can see and apply to an opportunity. So again, lots of words. Let's root it in an example. Um, I'm actually going to borrow an example that one of our scouts surfaced to us in a mission because it was so incredible. Um, so let's say, let's, let's stay on the topic of makeup. Let's say we're a research team and we're running a project on dscout um, to take a look at the purchasing behaviors of makeup. When we launch our screener, we narrow our search only to participants on our platform who have selected the new woman option on their profile. By doing this, we're missing an entire target market of drag queens. These participants may have checked male or something else or prefer to not identify in their profile but in my experience are some of the most knowledgeable participants to have in your study. If I was leading this project, this is exactly who I would want to talk to about the considerations that go into purchasing makeup. 
By focusing on behaviors instead of gender, we can avoid limitations that these buckets of oversimplification create. Just can I jump in for a second? Yeah. Greg has a question about just that. I think that reflects on or suggests what you just said there. Sure. He, uh, well, Greg, you don't provide referrals, and I guess we should have asked for folks. So I'll say, Greg asks, uh, have you identified some reasons where a company might rightfully ask for gender? And Greg, it, it strikes me that um, instead of maybe directly asking that, I would turn it back on to you to both ask, uh, what, why might you need gender or self-identified gender? And also, could you do just what you said there? look at um, attitudinal, perceptual, or behavioral data instead of. I know that in market research and product research, I mean, I'm a, I'm a behavioral social scientist by training. Sure. A lot of the work that I did looked at sex differences in whatever the outcome mm -hmm. variable was instead of just focusing on that outcome variable and looking for details in flirting behavior or makeup purchase decisions. I think that's what Jess, Lindsay, and this whole team is trying to uh, surface here is that you might actually find something more interesting and more relevant when you look at the behaviors, either physical instantiations of or attitudinal and perceptual responses to that, that sort of data. Exactly. But do you have any examples when uh, either working with a client or, or, uh, or otherwise when gender or, or, or gender identity might have played a role? Sure. I can actually speak to this, um, Lindsay speaking. Um, on the studio, we run a lot of tech projects, and we know from certain behavioral data that's been uncovered in the past that men and people who identify as men can have different tech behaviors. You know, they may be more tech forward than people who identify as women. Um, and so it's, it's understandable that you would want to balance a recruit. Um, it's important in research to make sure you're hearing from many different groups so that your insights aren't you know, off balance. If you're hearing from only one gender, you may not find something that you that you expected to or that you need to in order to fully have the research you need. And so we're not, you know, we what we essentially are, are talking about here is shifting the order of operations of how you're recruiting. We're talking about rather than surfacing gender as a primary mode of recruiting, we're talking about shifting to focusing on behaviors, key behaviors that allow you to identify which people are going to be best for your group, who's going to be most articulate, and, and to find those people first. And I'm, I'm certain that there will always be, you know, it'll be necessary to balance a recruit and to, to make sure you're not over-indexing on certain groups, sure. but we don't, we don't want anyone to be left out because a researcher thinks they're not part of the user base. You don't really know who your users are until you check and, and you ask all the people who may be involved. So, so that, that, that's, a yeah. great, that's a great example, sir. Yes, and right. also I just, I wanna give, cause we, we did have one example pop up last week. Um, and when, after we removed the pre-filter, we had a client that wanted to do a project on um, the women's department of a clothing store, right? And right off the bat, they had wanted, you know, only people who identified as women. So only people who had selected female in there. But talking with them and having a conversation, we kind of rooted it down to, who do you actually want to talk to? And they're people who shop in this department. There you go. So they asked about gender, but then they also had a follow-up question that said, typically, what section of the store do you shop in? And, you know, they were also grateful for that, um, conversation as well because we're getting more at the behavior instead of just assuming something about someone based on a label. Yeah, right? and so many of the customers who work with us want to create fans from their users. They want to move away from this instrumental uh, transactional relationship. We provide service, you use that service, exactly. therefore you are our users, and make you fans or, or some of our customers even say like family members, right? But they'll use these different terms and I think that's an outcome of this type of right. thinking and this type of design principles wherein you're asking uh, how would you describe your tech adoption behavior right. so instead of saying man woman oh, okay man let, let's make sure we get those tech adopters let's ask a question how often how likely are you to purchase uh, a new phone each year or, yeah. or again whatever the standard or, or similarly like where do you typically shop because most of my shoes are from the women's section and yeah. the hoodie right. i'm wearing is also from the right. women's section so that would have eliminated me, even though I do a lot of my shopping in the women's sector. Exactly. Various departments. So I, I, I like, again, as even, even from a pure academically trained social scientist, looking at the behaviors and attitudes makes perfect sense because you want to capture the most variance in a thing. And st starting from demographics can sometimes be misleading. Yeah, and one thing to add to this is in our secondary research for this project, we came across a lot of research that suggests that, like, 
or, you know, newer generations, Gen Zers, millennials, they're moving beyond gender in general. Um, we've got a lot of people who kind of don't subscribe to the concept of gender, who would prefer that their stores sell things in a unisex way, who would prefer to see advertising that isn't like, buy this women's razor, it's for women only. And, you know, to see a focus more on products and behaviors rather than putting people into buckets that don't fit. I understand that there's been a lot of research in the past, but I've been surprised every project about, you know, assumptions being totally thrown out the window for, oh, this type of person does this type of thing. You know, it's, it's kind of antiquated thinking. And so as, as time moves forward, I really think we're going to see more and more people who are demanding that these products and services they're, that they're, you know, they're going to pay their dollars to services that are, you know, more forward thinking like they are and less interested in boxing people in. Thank you for that detour. Yeah. <laughs> great question. Thanks, Greg. All right. Great. Um, so to recap, uh, these are the high-level principles that we use to inform the changes that we'll be hitting our app and platform in September. We're very excited about that. Um, we're also hoping that like keeping these at a high level, um, that they might also be able to translate to, to your experience, right? Like if you're facing a similar challenge of kind of taking stock of how inclusive your product, service, or platform is, that you might be able to, you know, translate the way that these apply to, 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 to yours. At the same time, though, um, we definitely want to stress that inclusivity is not a one-size-fits-all approach. The way we collect this information might be drastically different than the way that you need to. Um, so we're viewing these changes um, as a step in the right direction for Dscout, or what we're calling like an improvement for us for now. Um, that was a great question and segue to kind of our third point here is like thinking about ways to, to target folks based on what they do instead of who we think they are, right? So behaviors instead of gender. And finally, we do this together with our users. Um, we want to encourage our clients, customers, anyone really interested or listening to this to really do your research and get in touch with those that this impacts. One slide right here that is um, very important for us to communicate is we just want to really thank everyone who participated in this project as a scout. Um, this project was outside of the norm of dscout projects um, and really required folks to talk about some incredibly vulnerable moments that relate to their everyday experiences and the way they move through the world. Uh, we can't thank y'all enough for the emotional energy and trust you provided us to share these moments. Um, beyond that, just the amount of detail and effort that went into the designs and drawings and feedback really wowed us. It really impressed us. Um, here at DScout, our entire team is so grateful. So just to reiterate one more time, like, thank you so much. We appreciate you and you are incredible. Great. So, so we're going to wrap it up a little bit here, but before we do, um, we also want to mention that, you know, this, we see this as an open dialogue. Um, this is, these are our direct emails. Um, so please, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, anything, um, we urge you to, to get in contact with us directly. We don't, by any means, consider ourselves experts. I think by default, there are no experts in this field. Um, and we won't have the answers to everything, but we would love to talk with you about it, share the resources that we've found, and just create a discussion and, um, and hear your thoughts. Um, so please, please reach out. And also, just to toot our own little studio horn, um, I'd like to bring up that the studio has a lot of expertise in these really complicated projects and, you know, getting people to share really personal things, things you might not expect them to share. Um, you know, we've done projects for years now where we, you know, we work on really nuanced human behavior. And so if you have an idea for a project, if you want to run this research, but you're not sure where to start, um, we would love to help you. So feel free to reach out directly to the studio if you've got a project in mind and we can help you do the thing. Thanks y'all. We are having, we have a lot of questions and they're being upvoted, which is fantastic. Keep submitting the questions. Uh, there are so many to choose from here. There are a few about um, the healthcare space. And again, given that we are not experts and we have a couple of 
couple of questions around medication, uh, prescribing of medication, insights between biological sex and gender identity. Have you had, did you have any participants mention anything in the mission about any healthcare apps or maybe secondary or tertiary related to healthcare? Because we also have some folks asking about like, who are the worst offenders and we don't want to put any companies yeah. on black. But I'm, I'm curious if you saw any trends in the both good and bad experiences. And you mentioned some of the dating apps mm -hmm. you know, being uh, a sort of site. Were there, were there any other insights that you can pull from what they showed? Maybe as it pertains to the healthcare space? Yeah, and I think like in general, again, like these these principles, right, are talking we're more talking about the D Scout space. So we understand that the context for like a healthcare setting might have different requirements where biological sex assigned at birth is required to know, right? Um, so I know that like also relating it to the slide about the bar being kind of low, right? A lot of scouts, the friction or the issue that was happening with healthcare forms and apps is when the name, the legal name, was assumed as something that you would refer to the participant as. Or when the sex assigned at birth was assumed that that was their gender identity. Mm -hmm. So making sure that you understand the difference between those and that there's spaces for preferred name or there's spaces for pronoun um, so that the in-person experiences, even if you need that legal name for insurance, or you need the biological sex assigned at birth for you know healthcare records that there's spaces that don't remind the participant of those things or force that on them in that experience. Does that make sense? It does. That does. Yeah, and that's a great example of uh, I think one of the principles of human centered design, which is flexibility. Yeah. The, the entire notion of being agile, both in how you craft and uh, build your teams, is about flexibility mm -hmm. and, and not being too stuck in a design way. That's, that's why you iterate. Mm -hmm. So I think that speaks to that, that, that very well. Yeah, some of the app experiences we saw where there was a clear effort to, to be more convenient um, by, you know, kind of slyly pulling information from one space and applying it to another. Those, those assumptions, if they're not correct, can be really, really painful and confrontational for people. And so just making sure that your apps and services don't make those assumptions. Don't try to guess your users' identities. You know, that principle applies really strongly here. Um, and as to the other question about kind of frequent offenders, um, we definitely saw, you know, any place where you're asking your users' identities, any place where, you know, a lot of legal forms and profiles, a lot of housing applications. Um, we saw a lot of banking stuff, banking and payment software. Um, we saw, you know, definitely dating apps and definitely market research apps. Um, those those were brought up quite a bit. But I will I will root it in that it's it's it wasn't really the best and worst offenders because if you think about it, it's not just the way they collected it or the words they use, it's that entire experience. Mm -hmm. So I think we mentioned one of those experiences where it was like, sure, 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 tell us what your gender identity is, like write it in, but then they get to this wall where it's like, okay, now man or woman. And yeah. it's like that a whole experience, so maybe that was a great experience up front, but then at the end it was a worst offender. So thinking of it as a like comprehensive experience and not just this one screen too, yeah. um, we saw a lot of overlap for best and worst. Were, were there any insights that didn't make it into the deck? that you thought are interesting or noteworthy? Selfishly, as a researcher, I'm always curious what uh, what you saw in the missions and entries that didn't quite make it into the deck. Yeah, I think one thing, because I'm relatively new in this space, um, you know, inclusion is something I'm passionate about, but I, I haven't had a lot of direct contact with people who are non-binary. Um, and, and so just hearing how emotionally impactful the stories were, hearing how constant and kind of how frustrating it can be to have every single person you encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Kind of, you know, one scout talked to us about um, people who see me, they, they interpret clues like, what's my hair look like? What's my makeup look like? And they're trying to, to solve my gender puzzle. You know, what, what am I? What am I? And, and that every person they encounter in their day-to-day -day life is making those assumptions because they're still thinking in a binary. And, and so I think just like really hammering home how important it is to to be accepting and open to the concept that there may be other genders and and that you need to pay attention to that and why it's important because we're talking about real people and these are very complex and emotional issues and showing some respect and listening can go so so far i think also i would have loved to make just like five slides on the drawings mm -hmm. that we had and the designs because they were incredible and i'm thinking of there were two designs where they actually had it structured as um, this slider, like a like a spectrum, okay, right? Okay. So it was like which is like how like 
like pick on the slider where you best like identify, Did right? They yeah, and they anchored it with like man and woman, okay. and they like just had this like slider between it, um, and that it was really interesting. And the two of our seventy scouts, you know, had that in there, yeah. and just the the creativity and the thought that went into that um, was. Yeah, they, I we could we could make a whole deck on just sure. the designs. And could you speak a little bit more about what we D Scout are going to be doing in terms of our roadmap? I know September we have plans to release. Are you are we hoping to do feedback solicitation? Could you walk through some of our plans, either as we know them or are they as they're going to happen? Totally, they're a bit valuable. Asking about like how can I be doing some of this in my, in my work? Yeah. Yeah, they're 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 a little uh, malleable right now. I think like as a culture, we've really embraced the fact that we want to keep learning and like that keep that feedback loop going. Um, so we will be releasing the changes in September. Um, our scout team, our our mobile app team, um, has this great announcement that'll communicate to the scouts. You know what what we did, why we're making these changes and why they're important to us as a company. Right. Um, and then I think we'll probably check back again, you know, um, in six months or so to look at some of those write-in options. Um, you know, we might do a follow-up project to see how it's going. Um, and I think we'll probably look at the usage data too. We'll monitor it closely to make sure that no one's being excluded or discriminated against. So cool. Yeah. I actually just thought of one other um, interesting thing that kind of popped up in the data. Um, I think, I'm not sure what I was expecting when I went in, but I, I think I was kind of subconsciously expecting there to be a consensus among mm -hmm. our scouts about mm -hmm. what are the proper terms? What does the proper list look like? What, you know, what, what should be included and what should be excluded? And, and what I think surprised me the most is just how varying the opinions can be. The designs were all across the board. Like we saw, we saw designs that were very minimal, one scout even designed uh, 404, this page does not exist. We don't even ask gender. Wow. Um, and we saw things that were incredibly detailed, very long lists that were very, very, you know. Yeah, like 30 options. Yeah. Or yeah. Trying yeah. to, you know, kind of include all of the different buckets. Sure. And, and, you know, one of the most interesting, you know, we asked scouts, what should this section be called? And it was evenly split between gender and gender identity. Yeah, like and that was really identity. surprising to wow. me because just the the very nuanced arguments pro and you know pros and cons of both sides and uh you know we had to kind of puzzle over that one for a while and and we may revisit it in the future if we get more feedback suggesting that you know gender isn't inclusive enough um but there were there was just a a ton of different you know there there is no one culture that can speak to this there is no unified group um that that represents all of these points of view every single person we talked to had a completely different and unique experience and so it kind of just reinforced the idea of like talk to users talk to a lot of users um, talk to as many people as you can as many people as you have time for because they will all tell you something unique and it's important to try to make a solution that accommodates everyone and is a little flexible well i sincerely and selfishly appreciate just some of your time Again, their emails, both Jess and Lindsay's emails are right there. They would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for the time. And we will see you on the next one. Thanks again, y'all. Really Thanks, appreciate man. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for coming.